Firstly, the midterm dates to be posted on the course website. Just take a quick note of that, the date and time and the location. Uh, secondly, regarding electronic assignments, uh, please make sure you follow the instructions of the course website carefully. That requires you to share the document with the TA and my Gmail addresses. Please do not email assignments directly to us. Uh, secondly, Keep take note if you're scanning documents in. Uh, just watch the resolution on some of those images. We're getting assignments of 30 megs, that's unnecessary. Uh, you can easily scale down those images down to 5 megs and they're still very, very clear. Uh, so just use your image editing software to computer to do that. Um, with this Google Doc sharing, um, there's, an, there's an option to send an email for like a notification email. Do you want that check or check as a matter? I guess send, I think it sends like a notification It sends one back to you then. It just sends a copy of the team. Oh, okay. It doesn't do anything for us. Okay. Okay. We will always receive your documents, so don't worry. Don't check and ask us for confirmation. We will always receive it. Yeah, um, it's, it's just for people, if you want the assignment and it's like, submitted before class or like, by the end of the day? I'm not picky. If I say at class, the beginning of the period or the end of the period, is fine. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah, so no, not the end of the day, okay. but, uh, but I want to like in this hour. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Please, for those of you that are in both my classes, make sure you pick the correct address. A few of you have emailed your 4M assignments to 4 MTAs. So they're not going to uh, do anything with that. Um, please make sure of that. Uh, they're, they're very, very different email addresses, so there's no way you can get them confused, and that's intentional. Um, so just make sure you use the appropriate one. Uh, you're also welcome to hand in paper here at the front. Now, I do recognize that for today's assignment, there was a typo on the course website. We're at one location of the site, it says it's due tomorrow on the 18th. Um, I, two other places on the website are due on the 17th. So I will accept submissions till tomorrow, 8.30 in the morning. Um, if you need to resubmit your electronic assignment because you want a bit more time, feel free to do that. If you want to resubmit your paper assignment uh, in TA tomorrow, feel free to take it back and, and, and it ends tomorrow. Um, so that, that was just a mistake. It was actually due today, but I will accept and until tomorrow. What time tomorrow? 8.30 in the morning. Um, okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's take a look here at this new topic. This is a very straightforward concept that we're going to cover today. It's the topic of particle size characterization. It's a mouthful of words that means nothing more than simply how do we describe particles? How do we characterize particles? Now, when we look at particle size analysis, there's three ways that we, we can look at particles. Two of the ways make sense for this course. The third way, composition, is of interest to, um, to other areas, particularly, say, reactor design, or um, the process is where you're altering the composition. In our case, we're not really doing that. Um, so the composition of a solid particle, obviously, is how it's made up. That's what that's referring to, the uniformity of the particle. Uh, particles that you will encounter in practice are never of one type of material. So the most common example of that is the mining industry, where the rock that you're extracting out of the ground is a combination of chemicals. Uh, and those, those various particles make up a composite particle and there's an average density and average conductivity over the whole particle. So we're not really focusing on that here in this uh, class today. What we are focusing on, however, is how to characterize the particle shape, which we're going to do next, and size, which we'll do after that. Work. Those are two important features because our principle of separation over the next few classes is going to be affected by the particle shape and size. So we need some ways to describe that. So when we talk about particles, we talk about the shape of them in two categories, either regular or irregular. So a regularly shaped particle would be either spherical or cubic. And we like those two definitions because they're very easy to work with. We've got easy equations. Uh, we, can, we can conceptually understand them and work very well with spherical particles and cubic. And of the two, spherical is almost always preferred because it's closer to our um, real, real experience with particles. We're unlikely to, to work with cubic particles unless you're in the business of packaging products. Um, but we're, for our processes, almost always the particles we're going to encounter will be spherical or close to spherical. 
when we talk about irregular shape, of course, there's e everything else. And um, there's, there's some examples of glass, sand, rock. Those are irregularly shaped particles. Um, most solids will fall under that category. So it's true, though, that most particles will be irregular. Today's class you're going to see is how do we try to take an irregular irregularly shaped particle and express it in terms of an equivalent regular spherical particle. So we'll convert an irregularly shaped particle's dimensions and characterize it in terms of a spherical particle that has equivalent properties. So this is our goal here, is finding these equivalent spherical particles that match the same properties as the irregular particle. So the one key way we try to do this is to come up with some number that tells us how close that particle is to this ideal spherical shape. So it's a number called the sphericity. Um, we like spheres because they look the same from any, any angle that we approach the object. So if that object's falling down vertically or uh, being flung horizontally in a centrifuge or a cyclone, the particle appears the same from the fluid's perspective. The fluid that that particle finds itself in, that particle appears in the same way. So the same friction from all angles, the same uh, drag forces and so forth. So we like, we like spheres for that reason. Um, every other particle we encounter, so glass, sugar, sand, these irregularly shaped particles will behave in a different manner different from this ideal spherical particle. So we like to try and make a particle, uh, or try to gauge a particle's behavior in terms of how closely it approximates a sphere. One way to do that is to count with this number <coughs> called the sphericity psi, which is a value between 0 and 1. So what I'd like you to do is actually try this out here. Try this out. Find what the sphericity of a cube is with equal lengths of all, all sides, C. And you'll need your calculator for this. Um, and try to unpack this formula for the example of expressing a perfect cube in terms of and finding its, sphere, its sphericity. If you need any information, just ask.
So in your calculations, notice that this, this number is size dimension, so your units in the numerator and the denominator are going to cancel. to the volume of the cube and solve for the radius of that sphere. So what's the sphere with the same volume as the particle? So we want to first calculate the sphere with the same volume as the particle, and then what's the surface area of that sphere? Well, we, we now know the radius of that sphere. We can calculate the surface area of that sphere. Of the sphere. So let's call this the area of the equivalent sphere is equal to 4 pi r squared is equal to 4 times pi times this term squared. So what I'm going to do is I'll just simplify this and write this as ck dash. So ck dash squared. So if that constant k dash is that messy uh, cubic. And then we divide that by the surface area of the particle. C's cancel over there, you can solve for that constant k, and you can get the value of 1 8. What is the sphericity of a sphere? 1. 1. one. Okay. So that's, that's easy. So that's the best we can do. The closer the particle sphericity is to 1, the more spherical it is. So straightforward way that we can quantify spheres and this number sphericity is used in all sorts of particle size calculations. For those of you that go into this in more detail in your future careers, we won't go into this class, it's not the purpose of this course. But this number sphericity will keep coming up um, in many contexts. Now, 
There's other ways you can describe irregularly shaped particles. The one, the, the common theme though is the following. We're going to find the diameter of a sphere, or the radius of the sphere, it doesn't matter which. The diameter or radius of the sphere that has the same property as the irregularly shaped particle. Either the same volume, the same surface area, the same surface area per unit volume. This, this one is interesting. The same area in the projected direction of travel. So that's what we've been looking at the last week was that drag force on a spherical particle. We, we have the projected area of that, that sphere. For an irregularly shaped particle, we can find its equivalent area in the projected direction of travel and then find the equivalent sphere that has that same diameter. We can find the same settling velocity as the irregularly shaped particle and then back calculate through the Stokes law what that equivalent diameter would be. Or what we're going to consider next here is what equivalently shaped sphere will fit through the same square size aperture. So a square size aperture is exactly that. It's a, an aperture, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, whole, with the terminology, is, is an opening or a hole, square shaped hole that this particle will need to pass through. So that's one of these guys. Like these two around. These are apertures or screens, uh, sorry, screens with, with holes of a certain aperture size. Okay, so while those screens are being passed around, just uh, one is very fragile. Please uh, just be careful with it. The other one is, is, is more robust. Um, think of equivalent particle sizes in the terms of this example. This is a neat example. Um, that this professor at the University of Akron has on his website. How would you quantify yourself if you were measuring the circumference around your waist? Okay. How would you quantify yourself as the diameter of a sphere that has the same surface area as your body? What would that diameter be? So take your surface area of your body calculate whatever that is in meters squared and find the equivalent sphere that has that same surface area. And the diameter of that sphere would be one way to calculate your bodies as an equivalent sphere. Okay. Or another way is find the length of the longest cord in your body. In other words, the longest part that you can connect from one point to the other point, which is usually the toe to head <laughs> and measurement. Um, and that, that length would be one way to quantify yourself. Okay. So, those are three different ways that you can quantify yourself and a regularly shaped object. Yeah. No, I'm just saying your arms. Both, both okay. <laughs> okay. So you could use each of those diameters you calculate, or each of those lengths that you computed over there, in different contexts. So the first one would be used in the context of size and clothing, or a life jacket. Or the second one would be used to estimate heat losses through your skin. So that's uh, used. Um, like you could use that to model the heat loss to your body and then find the appropriate clothing to counteract that heat loss and minimize the heat loss. Um, the length of the longest cord would be appropriate, say, if you buy a sleeping bag. You want to make sure that that, that works for you. If you're just buying a bed, like from the, the length of the bed is, is long enough. Okay, so irregularly shaped particles re-expressed in terms of the equivalent diameter of a sphere or of another, of another object. So, what we're going to look at today, not or next, I'd say, is uh, particle size. We've looked at particle shape there. We'll come back to that concept of particle shape in future sections of this course. But now in particle size, we're going to look at, at various properties. So we know that particles that we deal with are never the same size. We kind of hypothetically assume a certain diameter when we calculated sedimentation velocity. And you'll see in the next class, we'll use the diameter of a particle when we calculate the size of the centrifuge to separate that particle. But we have to recognize that our feed coming into those centrifuges and sedimentation vessels and other separators are not of a single diameter. There's a whole distribution of diameters. And that's what we're going to quantify next. How do we measure that distribution? Those screens that are being passed around are one way of doing that. And then how do we talk about that distribution once we've measured it? And then what is an average particle size? What is a suitable average to work with? Okay, and the reason why this is important is when you start uh, working, you may 
come to the following context. If you're working in the mining industry and you're crushing ore, the feed is ground in several subsequent steps. So you've got multiple unit operations that take that ore from large rocks of several meters in diameter down to smaller and smaller sizes. And one, at one of those intermediate operations, you could be talking of a feed of five to six centimeters down to this, this terminology, 70 to 90% passing a 200 mesh seed. So when someone is saying that to you, what do they mean? When there's 90% passing a 200 mesh seed, how, the, how, do you, how do you interpret that terminology? So that's where we're, where we're looking at. So any area that where we're handling solids, we're going to deal with distributions. What are some industries where we're handling solids? Wastewater treatment, so there we're dealing with uh, our bodily waste or other waste from a chemical process that needs to be treated. The solid suspended in that liquid. Other areas? Mm. Food industry, can you give some examples? Uh, sugar. Sugar? The sugar cane. Sugar cane. So the sugar flow sheet we saw earlier, there'll be the granulated sugar that we use on the table, there will be caster sugar that's used for baking and other sugar products. Yeah. Pharmaceutical. Pharmaceutical. That's a big, big deal is the particle size distribution. Especially because the active ingredient that actually does the job of the medicine will have one particle size distribution and then the base solid that that active ingredient is blended with will have a very different particle size distribution. And in the pharmaceutical industry, one big concern is that that blend is well mixed, right? You don't want to give someone a tablet that's close to 100% active and no recipient, or vice versa. You don't want someone taking a drug and it's actually not present because the particle sizes are not appropriately sized. Any other areas? Mining. Mining, yeah, so crushing rocks and, and making sure that you get your particles to the right size to expose them to liquids that you're going to treat them with later. Biomass, so those of you in the bio area, when you're treating biomass, those fibers and, and products that we're <coughs> taking in as feed, all of these are very irregularly shaped solids and those need to be processed through unit ops. Anything else? <laughs> There's many, right? Obviously, it's, it's, you're limited to uh, a few others like here that I'll, I'll mention are um, latexes and paints. That's a very, very important criteria is the particle size distribution at the end of the reaction to make sure that the latex being formed is on the useful particle size distribution to use downstream. Okay, so if you're dealing with petrochemical industry, you almost never deal with solids. You're just dealing with liquids and gases. You guys will be lucky. But uh, most others, most other industries will almost always encounter the solid of some sort. Petrochem actually, uh, you will actually deal with solids in the form of catalysts. So catalyst particle sizes are, are important and those break down over time and how do you treat that and recover that catalyst from the gas stream is, is critical. Okay, so almost all industries will encounter solids of some sort. Um, let's talk about how the ranges that we'll encounter. So we will always work in microns when we're dealing with solids in general because it's a, it's a convenient number to work with. So micron 10 to the minus 6 meters and we're dealing with very, very fine powders here. So pigments and powders and, and those all the way up to pet pellets. Flour and sugar are daily products that we encounter here. So powdered soap, powdered sugar, Detergents all appear in that 10 to the 3 micron range. 10 to the 5 micron, that corresponds to 10 centimeters at the top. So 10 centimeter sized pellets um, at the very, very most. And then you've got like, just below that would be pet foods, cat food, dog food, and so forth. And then all the way down to very, very fine powders. So those are those are order of magnitude numbers we're dealing with. That's a huge range. That's uh, seven, seven orders of magnitude that we're reviewing. So there's that screen going around. Now let's talk about the, the label that's on the side of the, side of the screen. Uh, where, who's got the screen at the moment? Okay, so it's up there. If you had a chance when it was going around, you may have noticed on the side it had this label here. So here is the number 10. 
Tyler equivalent screen. So this is actually the Canadian standard screen follow uh, going around. Um, the Canadian standard C series, but what, but what they've done is they've given the equivalent Tyler number, Tyler mesh number 10, and then they've put there on the side opening in metric. Um, let's take a look at what that means. So the 10 mesh screen is two millimeter openings. The 10 refers to the number of openings per linear inch. So here's how the mesh series works. As the mesh number goes higher and higher, that's number of openings per linear inch. Obviously, that opening size needs to become smaller and smaller. So the finest particles will be landing up on the higher mesh numbers. The coarse particles are retained on the small mesh numbers. Now, that sequence of openings is not accidental. So going from 850 openings to 710 to 600, what you'll notice is that there's an approximate ratio between successive openings of that, that ratio. So the fourth root of, of root two, uh, sorry, the fourth root of two will approximately, so I think 710, if you take that, you'll get some number like 592, let's say. So they've just rounded up to 600 openings, uh, uh, 600 micron, but in general, that, that ratio is mostly obeyed as you go, go up the screen. So that's the US series, and that's what you'll likely encounter. If you have the opportunity of working in foreign countries, they, will, they may quite likely adopt a different standard. So there's the British standard and there's another US ASTM standard that you may, may encounter. But Tyler is, is very, very common. Yeah. What do you mean by linear inch? Is it just inch? Yeah, so, it's, uh, so you could obviously talk about the number of openings per square inch. On, on that uh, C that was going around, but what we're referring to is the number of openings on a linear inch. Uh, so just one, one dimension. So it's obviously easy to calculate the number of openings per square inch from that. Any other questions on that? No screens. Okay, so how are these used? Um, almost every lab you'll go to that's working with solid particles will have one of these uh, sorts of machines, these stacks. And you stack your, your apertures with the largest and the top smallest at the bottom, feed your sample on the top screen, and then turn on this vibratory uh, device to shake all the particles down, and particles of various sizes are retained on different screens. The final um, tray over here is actually just a solid pan. You'll have the final, uh, final catch points, as it were, for um, the finest particles that pass through the screen. By convention, also, you pick your first screen so that 100% of your material will pass through that screen. Okay. The reason if you don't do that, uh, then you're never quite sure if that top screen has particles of a larger size. So you you always you estimate you need to do it by trial and error, but, but the first screen is usually you aim to have 100% of your material passing through, so you can guarantee all the particles are of at least smaller than that size. And then the subsequent screens will catch the, the amount of particles. So these, uh, each lab will have a different protocol for this. Some labs will shake for five minutes, other labs will shake for three minutes, some labs will shake at one intensity, another lab at a different intensity. Uh, the key is, obviously, within a company, they have their agreed on protocol, and that's how everything gets measured relative to that baseline. And there's, there's standards around that as well for various industries. Obviously, that intensity, you can't be too aggressive. You don't want to break particles that are otherwise solid up, and then get the distribution of particles that appear to be finer than it otherwise it is. Um, but you do want the intensity to be strong enough so that particles which are stuck together will that are normally separate, but just happen to be stuck together for some reason, can separate somewhat. Uh, one way that this is often done effectively to break up particles is to use wet screens. So you just you have water flushing through it. Um, but in some instances, that, that leads to problems now, because then once you've separated your particle sizes on each screen, you then have to take that, dry it first in the oven, weigh it, weigh it. Because that's what the next step is. Once you've broken out your particles on a different screen, you take the amount retained on that screen, weigh it, 
and then you report the weights retained on the screen. That's what we're really interested in, is the mass of particles retained per screen. So if you've gone and done weight screening, you first need to uh, dry each screen before you go and do your weight. Yeah. Oh, this is more for like research sort of standards? This is not just research, no. Um, the companies will do this on a regular basis. So they'll go take a sample of their solids, leave it in a separator, put it through a set of screens just to make sure that the product that they're selling or that's going to the next step in their process is on target. So this is done very, very regularly. And so, so regular that this manual intensive process is bypassed. And what companies will then do is they try to automate it in some way. Um, so I seem to have that slide dropped off unless I passed it. Okay. So I, I, I intended to have a slide um, of automatic inline screening. So companies will have systems which you can purchase at very, very high cost. You can instrument inline into a pipe and it will measure the particle size distribution in real time without having to take a sample, screen it, weigh it, and all that laboratory and tedious and error prone uh, protocol that can go with it. So you can spend uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars even to get an automatic, automatic measurement system. These systems are fairly sophisticated that you buy one system that kind of goes out to multiple points in your process and it will take samples from various locations on your on your flow sheet and, and get your particle sizes at whatever frequency you need. Um, so there's, uh, but, and those obviously use different methods. Those use light and light scattering. So we're comfortable or recognizing from a physical principle, a small particle with a beam of light will, will scatter it. A larger particle with a beam of light will scatter to, uh, to a different extent. So these light scattering techniques uh, play on that property of the particles to ma make their measurements in an automatic way. Okay, so let's, um, let's work through this example now. Here's a sample of product that's been taken. We have our pan at the bottom that's collecting the smallest particle size. Here's our, our sequence of meshes. After shaking for a period of time, this is the mass retained on each screen. Prove to yourself that the, these numbers in the last two columns are correct. This is how we're going to report particle size. We're going to report the cumulative percentage passing. So make sure you can calculate this last particle. I uh, last column. <laughs> yeah. So aperture is the size of the, the openings. Make sure you can duplicate the fourth and the fifth. So this one's fairly, uh, fairly straightforward. Just uh, a few things to be aware of, it, and that's more just a, about convention here. 
So what's up here on the, on the screen right now is the standard way of reporting these uh, size distributions. And what we do is we take the, we work from top to bottom. We have our aperture size, so I can get the second column by just looking up the Tyler series mesh number and finding the aperture size. So a mesh 14 screen has 1400 micron openings, a mesh 16 screen has 1180. And what I do is I report the average size of the particles retained on the 1180 or mesh 16 screen. So let me just draw this visually if that will help. So here's my mesh 14 screen, and here's my mesh 16 screen. So particles that have passed through and are retained over here on the mesh 16 screen, we know that they're smaller than the 1,400 microns, but larger than 1,180. So these particles are between 1,180 and 1,400 microns. All these particles retained on the mesh 16 screen. But what we do then to report the average size is there's two approaches. One is to use the, the, the pro, one approach says take the average as being 1180 plus 1400 divided by 2, and that gets you 1290. That's what, we're, that's what we will use here. There is another convention where you take the product of 1180 and 1400 and the square root of that. So it's the geometric average. We will use simply the arithmetic average for our, for our screens. Okay, so what we're saying then is that the particles that are retained on this mesh 16 screen are going to be of average size 1290 micrometers. So 1.29 millimeters is the average size of the particles on that screen. Now we recognize obviously that there's some smaller and bigger, but that's a small window that we can work with. And there was 9.1 grams of solids retained on that mesh 16 screen. The next screen down, uh, mesh 18 screen, this one had 32.1 grams of solids. Okay, and then we keep going and keep going and then until our final pan. So what we do is we, we do, we even know our mass that we added at the beginning, 491 grams of, of solids was added at the beginning and we should get 491 out at the end. You will find in practice that that never happens though for some reason. Some of this mass happens to disappear somewhere. But by and large it usually balances. So 491 grams was the mass retained on every screen in total. So now we can calculate the fractional mass retained. So 9.8, 9.1 grams retained on this first screen divided by the total mass, 491, gets me the value of 1.8%. Thirty-two point one grams divided by four hundred ninety-one. That gets me six point five percent. And I can keep going down the list, and obviously that those percentages, if I add them all up at the end, must add it to hundred percent. So we're simply accounting for the fraction of mass on each screen. Then I can accumulate that mass. So what we talk about is the cumulative percent passing is one way of dealing with this. So 100% of my mass passes through the first screen because there's no, no retention on it. Uh, the next screen, there's 98.1%. That comes from this figure over here. I apologize, this is an error. This should be 1.9 or 1.8. Okay, so that 1.9% is retained. In other words, 98.1% passes. And you just keep working through copy and paste your formula down the spreadsheet to the bottom. In this case, no mass was, or, or close to zero mass was retained on the pan, so in, within rounded error, there's no percent passing mass. So that's, you call that percent retained? This here is, uh, no, this is, yeah, this is percent retained. So be careful of cumulative percent retained and percent retained. So could you explain that again? So cumulative percent passing is the total amount of mass that passes through that screen. So that second screen over there, 16, 
9.1 grams remains on the screen, but 491 grams minus 9.1 passes. So 491 minus 9.1 is 5 by 491 gets in a passing. So what we do then is our next step is to show this diagrammatically. Um, we draw two plots. The first plot on the left is simply the percentage retained on each screen. So my, my smaller screens down here, they have a smaller percentage and then there was the screen in the middle that had most of the mass retained and then it drops off again. And so that's one way to visualize the distribution of the solids. The other way is the cumulative screen. So the green curve is more what we were interested in. It's the percent passing. So the very, so those very large opening screens, like the one two nine zero, the higher number of microns, the larger particle size, most of the solids passes through that screen and that curve drops off. That S shape is very standard to see on the cumulative curve. To me, these are far more useful to deal with. So, so what companies will do is they'll try to take this curve and then get one number from it. So they'll try and calculate some average from it. So the average part of the size. Or they'll say, what is the percentage passing a certain size on the horizontal axis? We'll see that coming up in the next classes. I'll show you a few examples of that. But far more useful is to actually be aware of what your particle size distribution is. And instead of trying to round it down to one average. Because, for example, we, all, we can see trends of like a bimodal trend in, in those curves would indicate my particle segregating into two size distributions. And it would indicate a blend of particles. So a blend of smaller particles and larger particles being combined somewhere. And that could indicate a problem perhaps with your process's operation. So if you just go and take that curve and calculate the average particle size directly from it, you'll, and just report that, you'll never really see the, the full picture. Okay, so the approach, the preferred approach is to use the curve and, and, and work with that. But we do recognize that people need averages from these. Um, for reporting purposes. So what they, they'll go do then is there's at least eight or ten different ways one can go calculate averages from these curves. If we go through all the formulas, we can probably spend a week or two on them, right? Because they're so involved and really, to me, that's not the, the important part. Because if you look at all those formulas, they're, they're pre-programmed into the software for the, for the um, analytical instruments. So what we'll simply do is we'll just look at look at them in this context here, in this example. So here's four different means that are reported. There's the arithmetic mean, which is a straightforward average of the particle sizes. There's the volume mean diameter. So the volume mean diameter accounts for the volume of the particle passing through the screen. The surface mean diameter is probably the one that you're most you'd likely to have encountered prior to this course. So that's the surface of an equivalent sphere that will pass through the screen's opening. And the reason why this one's important to us is because that, that south to mean diameter, or the surface mean diameter, is the one that we use for our mass transfer calculations. And so we find the equivalent diameter of a sphere that has the same surface area as our ir irregularly shaped particle. And then there's also the mass mean diameter, which when I looked at the equation for this, I, I really can't come to some interpretation that time. There is there's this, this formula for it that people will sometimes use. And then there's at least another four others that I've, I've, I've seen in the textbooks that will, will identify one or more properties from the distribution. Now, what, I'm, what I'd like you to take from this here is, let's take a look at this example that illustrates the point quite nicely that I'm trying to make. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different means shown for a histogram at the top for a particle size distribution. So there's seven, seven types of means. And then on this distribution is another sample, an entirely different sample, and it has its seven different means as well. So the mode is that first vertical line is on the second distribution, that is the mode. 
And then the harmonic mean of the second line over is this one over here. The key point that this, that this illustration is making is that the arithmetic mean, which is the one given here by this arrow, is the same for the first distribution as well as the second distribution. So the arithmetic mean is the mean particle size that's most commonly used to summarize these curves. So both of these have the same arithmetic mean, but look at their distributions from a diagram, diagrammatic point of view. How do you quantify the first distribution? Smaller particles. Anything else about the first distribution that you notice? Okay. Left view. Skew to the left, so there's a again the fine particle sizes. Yeah. It's got a longer tail. It's got a longer tail over to the right, so uh, we have a, a much, much longer tail relative to the second distribution of larger particles. So 25 and higher particle, 25 and higher microns, uh, sorry, 20 to 25 micron particles. Whereas this distribution has no particles in that range. So the first distribution is much broader. A, more, a greater bias to the smaller particle sizes for sure, but also has a very long tail over to the, to the right. The second distribution, how would one quantify this one? More uniform. More uniform, yeah. Really? So it's compared to the one. Okay, so yeah, uniform from a statistical description means something quite, I think you're using a word out of, out of statistical concept, context. So uniform distribution means more flat lines, more box shape. So a uniform distribution would be a distribution that looks almost like that. But be careful, I, I wouldn't call the second one un, more uniform. Um, Narrow. Narrow would be would be the word I'd use. So relative to the first distribution, the second distribution is much narrower. Uh, so it doesn't cover the full range of particle sizes as as the first one would be a different point on that. So key point here that I'd like you to take from today's class are the two these two things. Um, multiple means are available quantifying various properties of the distribution. But this, the second one is that even though we have these multiple means, what you should prefer to use in practice is the actual distribution itself. Okay. We're going to see in the next class how we pick off various points on that distribution to use when we uh, design these. Okay. So when we start looking at cyclones on the Thursday, 